Welcome to the latest edition of Broadcasting Today. Tonight, we have David A. Smith, a futurologist. Not a clairvoyant like Mystic Meg, but somebody who helps people try and see into the future and see what's best for them. All part of our mission here at Middlesex University London to teach students how to think, but also how to do. Welcome to the latest edition of Broadcasting Today. We have David A. Smith, futurologist, with us. I'm Kurt Barling, and I'm joined today on the platform by Leila Osterberg. Uh, David, first of all, many people would think perhaps futurologist, clairvoyant, mystic Meg. What took you back to the future? Oh, yeah, OK. <clears throat> it wasn't a crystal ball, as you might imagine. Um, quite simply, the desire to look slightly further ahead than normal people did, quite frankly. Um, like a week? Or... I, wor well, I, wor I worked in a company that was quite avant-garde and quite keen on looking ahead. I worked in strategic marketing, and we looked a little bit like two or three years ahead. And then I needed to look a bit further because we were the slowest company on the planet to move. So I found these people called futurists, and after five or six years of working with them, I became one. What does a futurist do? Well, exactly as you said, it's a bit like a historian looks backwards and looks for evidence of what the past was like. A, a futurist looks forwards and looks for evidence of what the future would look like. So we examine the future and hopefully make sense of it that's uh, meaningful. The world is a very complicated place with <coughs> many different markets. And f you have looked at across the piece, really, haven't you, at all areas of the economy. What are there, are there common commonalities between those different uh, uh, parts of the economy when you boil it down? Yeah, um, yeah, there are actually a lot of commonalities. Um, everybody in individual organisations thinks they're unique. Everybody in individual markets think that they're unique. And everybody in individual countries think they're unique. And actually when you examine, as we do quite a lot of the time, different countries, different markets, you find there's a commonality about people and de demographics, how, how old we're going to live and... Uh, and what our lifestyles are going to be like and our, our propensity to marry and remarry and ha have children. There's so much commonality there. Technology has driven everything for the last 50, 60 years anyway, and that's common everywhere with different degrees of engagement. Uh, and I can be in China one minute having exactly the same conversation as in Mauritius, as in Singapore next week. We'll be having the same conversations with everybody thinking they're the only people embracing those changes. How much of what you do is about helping people overcome their fear of the future. Yeah. Because whether you're in business, uh, whether you're a, 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 a worker, the fear of the future mm. sometimes can be overwhelming. I imagine a lot of what you do when you go around the world is kind of like a soothsayer trying to you know, make people feel more comfortable about the challenges that they will have to face. Well, that's a very good point. Actually, most of the time, people tell me I, I frighten them crazy <laughs> because I, I just bring too much change, too many overlaying aspects of change. But you're right, what, what I tend to do is, is after I've maybe just helped people understand the future is different, uh, and by, by the way, intellectually we get that, but emotionally we don't behave as if it is. We tend to behave as if it's an extension of today. Um, so what I tend to do is show the amount of change we've already absorbed. You go back over the last 500 years, the last 100 years, the last 50, the last 10, the last five, we are massively good at embracing change. But actually, if you ask someone to embrace some change tomorrow, uh, we are resistant, we, we challenge it. Because human beings just don't like change. We like comfort and familiar surroundings. So, you know, we need to get that it's not a choice sometimes. So there is a bit of a fear factor in there. Mm. So you get the idea there's not a lot of choice. Then you get over that and go, actually, we're quite good at this. We're quite good at embracing change and, and moving forward. But there are those, aren't there, who say that the pace of change is intensive. Yeah. Are, are we... Are we imagining that, or is the pace of change intensifying? Yeah. Well, I studied it a while ago with some of our team because it sounds like a piece of marketing for futurists to say the pace of change is accelerating, so therefore you must pay more attention to what we're saying. But actually, if you go back to 1955, there are about 2 billion or so people on the planet. There are now 7 billion. And everybody is innovating and changing what they do and how they do it, and they're becoming more economically active. So you've got three times more people engaged in making things different 
than ever before. You've got 140 or so countries doing things, many of which had no innovation, no technology, hardly any industry or economy. So you've got a lot more people focusing on a lot more change and a lot more places. So even if you weren't looking at the degrees of, of depth of change, which we really are, just the volume of change means there's more ideas coming out of more places, and it's where they coalesce, it's where they overlap. We get really fundamental change happening. So I'm afraid to say, for anybody who doesn't like change very much, the future is awash with change. Back in 2000, um, give me some examples of things which, because of course we all got very excited, didn't we, with the new millennium and millennium bugs and all sorts of other things going to happen in this new millennium. Give me some of the things that you foresaw then that we now take as normal. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the evidence is there for people to find uh, us talking about these things. We, we foresaw tablets. Uh, using remote communications to have mobile newspapers reading on a train, for example. And everybody on a train now, you have to have a tablet or a phone to get on a train. Have you noticed? You're not allowed, allowed into a train now <laughs> yeah. if you don't actually have one. It's a bit like going to an airport. You yeah. can't go to an airport without a tablet or a phone to lose. So the whole point is, you know, these things are now commonplace. But in 2000, we were still using clunky phones that you pulled the cable out of and the screen had the telephone number on it, if you remember that. <laughs> there was nothing else there. You didn't watch a film on your clunky phone because it allowed eight characters to come up. So we, we saw that. We saw biometrics using hand prints to, to get access to your bank account. We saw uh, uh, glasses with text being displayed in them so they were overlaid with information. When you were out in the street, we saw uh, all sorts of, uh, of changes around the technology and the behaviour and personalisation. Uh, these things are now just coming to pass, so 15 years later. So it's quite fun to see these things come to fruition. We get it right quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, one distinction that uh, certainly will fall away is the old and new formats, as nearly everyone will end up in a digital pathway. Uh, do you see uh, any dangers with this? With digital? Yeah. Uh, no, not really. I mean, you could look at books and say the same thing. Any danger with using paper and handwritten things uh, and, you know, the sort of tools you use of the day, it's a tool of the day. It tends to surprise us and shock us and excite us in different degrees, depending who you are, yeah. when it first comes out. And then we go through that hype of, uh, of early take-up and it normally disappoints. And then we go through the trough of disillusionment as we think we'll never go back to that again. It's a disaster. No more 3D ever will come, <laughs> come to pass. And then we go, actually, it's quite cool. Yeah. It just may be born of a different technology. So, t you know, technology is neither here nor there. Uh, and digital is another word for technology. You know, we, yeah. we change the word occasionally. And it's the latest one because it's come from a sort of telephone end as opposed to coming from the computer end. But it's all about the same digitalization, the information technology. And uh, I don't see any, any, any threat to anybody in particular, as long as you... You have a look down the pike and say what's coming and think, can I gear myself to becoming knowledgeable or expert or uh, have an opinion about it and then embrace it? I think if you, tr if you try and endlessly fight it, you'll just get tired. Yeah. Of course, one of the areas where the digital transformation, as it were, has really uh, brought change in our own lives, all of our lives, is in television. I yeah. mean, there was a time when we would rock home at six o'clock, turn yeah. the telly on and see, you know, Michael <coughs> Burke on the news. Yeah. Uh, actually, most of the people here probably don't do anything of the sort. Uh, they probably look on their telephone or, or on their computer screen. Or So television yeah. has been profoundly changed in many ways by um, this digital transformation. Uh, where do you think the convergence debate is taking us when it comes to television? Yeah, no, great question about winners and losers, if, if, if sort of that. I just, last night I happened to look at, um, I made the mistake of sitting on one of the, the controllers for our television. I don't know if you've ever done that, but you can't find your way back, there's no clue. And I, I just counted the buttons on one of the zappers. There were 50 buttons on one, there were 45 on the other and 40 on the other. And I knew I'd sat on one and it, the screen wouldn't come on, I couldn't get a picture. So I thought either just spend the evening listening to it, which seemed like an option, find one of my younger children to, 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 to make it work, or, or, or press a lot of buttons and make grumpy noises while I was doing it. Well, I embraced the third. And I, the conversation we had in our house last night was when we were growing up, there was on and off, volume, and three channels. Yeah. And it made life easy. And you couldn't lose a zapper, it didn't have one, you had to get up. So, and, and that was your lot. And now we've got this amazing connection it's a screen, a panel of connection. And it's, it's we're at granular level, aren't we? Do I want to follow a 
a programme stream curated by one brand? No, I don't. I want to pick something from... I don't want to see any difference between uh, it being delivered by YouTube or Netflix or, or Love Film or BBC or ITV or some one of 170 other channels that my TV has or the infinite number of, uh, of programmes on YouTube or other sources. So I actually see it as a complete melting pot and the future to me of TV is curation probably by individuals mm. or call firms that they just happen to be pulling stuff together that I like, so I'll follow them. So the branding changes from the provider to the curator uh, and that I follow them. So uh, it's going to change. Uh, on one degree, it's going to change a lot in terms of access. The thing that isn't going to change is good content is good content. So well put together, interesting programs that engages, requires a human being with creativity and skill and intellect, maybe using more tech or maybe not, actually, but just producing good content. How we get at it is going to be really the interesting. The traditional providers of content are really going to have to radically transform their game, aren't they? Because yeah. up until now, they've been the, the gatekeepers yeah. of quality content. Yeah. And this new environment suggests that there's no way they can be the gate or the sole yeah. gatekeepers at any rate yeah. of that content. So how do they, perhaps that's why Tony Hall is saying today that the BBC experience is going to have to be about my BBC, in other words, yeah. each individual yeah. viewer's BBC. But it isn't going to be that. The BBC won't matter. And I'm sorry to say that if anyone from the BBC ever sees this, <laughs> but actually the BBC, <clears throat> what, what is the BBC? The BBC is, is a great provider of good content. Mm. And so there used to be a time when that was half the watch content in this country and, and across the world as well, uh, very prominent. Everywhere I travelled, you put BBC World on. Now people have muscled in like CNN and others. But the point was it, it had that. And you could talk about it being the brand. That's gone, I think. But the brand is now the programmes they make or they curate or they import and, and bring to us. And I don't need a channel. I don't need this concept of BBC. It's sort of sitting there a bit isolated. There's this funny bit of digital that I have to pay a licence fee for. I'll be, I'll be sent to jail. But the rest <laughs> of it I can choose to engage with or not. And now some, some, some body uh, in the BBC is suggesting now for, for catch-up, we've got to make them pay the licence fee. So going, taking the old model further into the digital world, and the digital world will react and not watch it and won't pay it. So it's got to come into... Be, decide where it is in the distribution process. Am I a manufacturer or am I a distributor? Or if I really want to be both, <clears throat> I've got to have a much bigger budget. Um, you have many high-profile <coughs> clients. Is there a particular organisation that you have learned from the most? That's an interesting one, isn't it? A difficult one, maybe. <laughs> it, it is actually a very difficult one because I think in different ways mm. there are different things you learn from people. I mean, I work in... In, in London with quite a lot of small media companies uh, and I love working with those guys because the creativity and the, the interaction. <clears throat> I work with a lot of insurance companies around the world uh, and I sort of enjoy the challenge of helping the industry realise it needs to change yeah. uh, and some of those people inside those organisations completely get it. So I love working with those people. Um, it's very hard to say there's one company I, I particularly think stands out as embracing change in a creative way to be honest yeah. but there are there are examples aren't there of these global companies which obviously you can learn from but in those global companies there's a danger that they will emasculate a lot of those creative types yeah. but i wonder whether you see that when you look across the spectrum whether you see i mean i've heard what you said about the bbc but in the end if global players replace the content that was provided tradition by the BBC, then yep. is there a danger that that gets emasculated? Yeah, of course it is. Exactly. You can never predict exactly how these things <laughs> will turn out. Because we're taking different positions in the supply chain. <clears throat> You're either a creator of content or a distributor. And if the distributors get the money, they'll try and control access because mm -hmm. that'll be their model. It'll be access. And access is the big issue. Mm -hmm. But there again, you've got all the telcos in the world who know their proposition isn't viable. I go to many conferences and speak to them and frighten them a little bit and then they reciprocate and they share the same view. No one wants to pay just for access. I want to pay for content. So I don't want to pay one service provider, a monolithic fee month after month after month for access to whatever they want to give me. I want to decide what I get and you provide the means of getting it to me. So they're looking at content. A lot of telcos and some of the wealthiest companies on the planet are looking how do they provide content which we'll pay for rather than access which we don't want to pay for.
Come back to your um, your vision of s sitting on your three zappers. Was that um, an example of the fact that television really is dead? Sort of, I think, in the, f in the way you might see television. You know, if you, if, you, if you ask people what is television, yes, it is not dead. It's, things take a long time. Things have very long tails. Mm. I mean, you could have said telex is dead. Who uses telex? Does it exist still? Well, it does. It's embedded under another name in the legal industry. It's the mm. only way of conveying digital documents legally between players. They're trying to work out how to have standards of facsimile, because mm. fax is brand new, isn't it? <laughs> You know, that's a 20-odd year <laughs> technology we're trying to work out how to use in some industries. The telex is still there. Mm -hmm. So when I tell people we're in the post-email era, which we are, that decline will take a long, long time as people get used to running their organisations using social tools and, uh, and apps. So come on, post-email, just run that past me. How yeah. are we in the post-email era? Yeah. Because <laughs> if I look at my myself. inbox every morning, yeah, yeah. there's nothing post-email <clears throat> about my inbox. No. Yeah. no, no, the problem with email is it doesn't work. Uh, if you ask anybody in, in uh, education or, or anywhere else about communication, a fundamental piece of communication is testing understanding. When's the last time someone sent you an email and said, do I, have I made myself crystal clear and, and do you understand what I'm asking or, or conveying? No. It's a dump and run technology. I can dump and run on lots and lots of people at the same time and run away. <laughs> I expect you to do it or behave in this new way that I've just told you. And there's a spreadsheet there for you filling out the results. Because <laughs> I attached it to it. And by the way, start Monday because it's strategic and important. You know? <laughs> It's a horrible scenario. Email is nasty because the way we've used it. It's not in intrinsically nasty any more than the telephone is intrinsically nasty. Social tools are much better because they, they're self-auditing, they're, 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 they're collaborative. You can organise, you can bring someone into a conversation that can pick up the, the, the thread of the conversation, the documents that were input. Uh, but nobody over 40 will even understand what I'm talking about. So digital natives have grown up with this stuff. Many universities don't give email addresses to people anymore so they'll come out and join their first company and they'll see this green goblin flashing on a screen here is your email address what's that we did that in history i think <laughs> uh, you know i even got a large insurance company recently to realize the top 40 executives of this top company in britain they had to use social tools amongst themselves so they had to get used to using the facebook type tools yammer type tools to actually get their company to move quick enough to get the job done so it's quite exciting so when i say post email it's it's not that it's going to go away It'll be here in 20 years' time. But it, the things that work better for us now, collaborating with outside agencies and people, collaborating across silos in companies and organisation, across teams, and having making some sense of it, are the social tools. So why don't we use those? How's that social media? I mean, like it's, a, it's still quite... It's, it seems quite fresh. I mm. mean, even here at the university, where, you know, it's full of young people who are willing to test things out, like yeah. Facebook, <clears> people... <throat> tweeting here tonight there are people on instagram and all those social medium social media yeah, um, cool. interfaces but how is that explain how that is going to enhance their futures what is it going to give them that makes their future more full of opportunity than ours was oh well that's easy easy to answer um the um <clears throat> i mean the both 12 and 14 year olds are using whatsapp They'll, they'll, when they get old, they go, what is this social media stuff you want me to use? But anyway, uh, on the internet, what's the internet? What's the world web? Web? What's the web? I don't go there. So that's a different question. But the, the question you asked me is, um, what, what's the difference? Well, look, put it this way. When I came out of uni, I had uh, a couple of dozen mates, of people I knew, and I may have lost most of their details of where they were anyway after a year. That's a bit sad. It's not true. <laughs> I'm, I'm making an extreme case. Uh, most kids, when they come out of university now, have 1,500 contacts that self-maintain. So in 10 years' time, they'll still know where those 1,500 people are. And when you've got a network of people like that to come out with, and you develop your careers in different ways, you've got this amazing circle of people that you can just stay connected with and, and learn from. So we're much, much, much better connected than ever before. That sounds slightly democratising, because what you've just described used to be called the old school tie. Yeah, it is. And if you go into the professional world and you've got these 1,500 or mm. 2,000, whatever is contacts, it's basically like an old school tie network yep. that you're constantly plugged into. And if you use it right, because social media, most folks don't use social media properly in a, in, a, in, a, in a work context. Most people use it just for, I don't know, it's, it's business card management. Mm. You know, <laughs> people, I know where people are so I can get at them. But actually we use it when we ever do any research. We ask our network to think about the thing we're about to research and can they think of other angles? And we always get... 
unbelievably brilliant pieces of insight because a few people have bothered and have the time and it's sufficiently motivated to reply. In fact, the, the, the world's largest uh, company in their sector, I was about to say which industry, and you, then you'll know who it is, so I'm not going to say it. <laughs> but they, they invited me to come and uh, uh, look at their innovation one weekend. And uh, I went down there and I looked at their vision for their company beforehand. And I suddenly realized that all the work they'd been doing that weekend before I got there didn't match their vision. It didn't help them achieve their vision. So I asked them, does it matter? They said, yeah, a lot. Well, none of these things match, so you've just wasted your weekend. And they went, you're right. <laughs> we have, we've just wasted our weekend. <laughs> but I happened to have asked my network, my LinkedIn network, which is my more serious people I connect with, um, how could you achieve what their vision said they wanted to achieve? And I had 40 pages of typed uh, notes from the people who bothered to respond. And there were some brilliant ideas. And their head of innovation, who's a lovely man from Finland, leapt over the table, spilling coffee and water as he leapt across to try and get it out of my hand before I took out the offer. And that's the value they got out of that weekend. So I didn't do anything. All I did was ask my network for some help. And if you ask your network for help, you'll get brilliant insights and it'll make you look terrific at work. How do you think social media will evolve and will they ever become profitable through generating income? Will you ever be able to? Yeah, it's an interesting or is it just <clears throat> somebody's flight of fancy? But actually, you can never actually make any money out of it. Yeah, monetizing these things is really quite hard, isn't it? Because you've got to have a new model. Mm. The old models don't work. It's back to my comment again. First, we do things differently, then we do different things. We're still doing things the same way. We're still trying to, you know, you had a magazine, you put adverts in it, you either made money or you went bust. Oh, guess what? You have a social media, you put adverts around it, you either make money or you go bust. It's, it, what's different? You know, what am, I, what am I paying for? Am I paying for access to a community? Am I paying for, I'm paying for, for views still. Um, so... Will they make money? I think they probably will because they're morphing into other things. They, I mean, fa Facebook bought Oculus and you know, that was $1.2 billion. So if you make enough cash over here, you go and invest in something over here that's more deeply engaging with people, you'll build a model that works eventually. Final question then before we open up to some questions from the audience. I mean, how do our students future-proof themselves to take advantage of the opportunities, even if those opportunities mm. might seem like overwhelming challenges at the moment. Yeah, I think you know the, the truth of that is, is about how you view the future. If you view that just the next thing as being it forever, then life's going to be a tiny bit uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah? But nearly everybody does. I frightened a bunch of PhD students at Surrey University recently with this, but unfortunately I had 70 people queuing up to talk to me afterwards for counselling and, and, and comfort. <laughs> It was a mistake on my part. I don't intend to do that here. But the whole point is, the next thing isn't going to last long. If you like your, your phone, if that's a comfort thing to have with you, within two years, you will look old-fashioned carrying a smartphone. What are you going to do then? Because these things are disappearing. Tech in some forms are disappearing. It won't be long before it all disappears into our surroundings. And that's where it's going, bit by bit by bit. We had a mainframe once. We've now got a very smart phone, why we call it a phone's beyond me, mine rings, it frightens me. It's, most, it's mostly visual and text, but uh, I don't even know what the sound is. But um, you know, we, we, we don't change enough. So what my encouragement to a student here would be, look at the future as a whole series of changing landscapes of technology, but hang on to the creative inspiration, whether you want to be a director or a producer or, 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 or floor staff or managers. It's about your ability to bring a human aspect to it and engage with that technology to produce something better than somebody else if you want to be competitive about it. So the human bit's still going to be very important, mostly around the creative. So let's talk to some of the humans here, see if they've got any uh, questions which you can uh, illuminate them on questions from the floor. Yes? Um, when you're looking at the future... Just can I just ask you to wait sorry, till that yeah. microphone comes in and it grab your sound perfectly then? Yeah. Um, when you're looking at the future, how do you distinguish between what is realistic and what could be classed by people as science fiction? Yeah. Um, well, normally it's about how far you look out. Because actually some of the most useful uh, people who indicate the future are science fiction writers. Because they don't have a, a, a context in which they're, they're framing the future. They just come up with a crazy idea. Um, several more. Karl Heinz Steinmüller is a friend of mine and I love the fact he writes in Germany. He's runs an organisation called Zenpunkt, and it invariably thinks well out of the box. Uh, and that's how you get, really, uh, the research that takes you 
towards that because if someone quite enjoys the idea of what that person's just envisaged you get innovation and change then you get the innovation that comes from just incremental kaizen change that you expect it to continue and then you look for those um shifts you look for points where whole industries or markets or technologies will shift and they're usually reasonably straightforward to predict but the problem with those is you can't predict when and to what severity because something else is changing over here that can influence so you do use um, the Asimovs, the, the Karlheinz Steinmüllers, the, the creative writers and thinkers, because they're part of it. And the filmmakers, I'd include that as well. They often look at credits of, of science fiction films, or even slightly tech-based uh, science films. They, you'll find a futurist in the credit somewhere, because you know, by and large, you know, we're reasonably useful at not believing the future is just what's tomorrow's version. We look a bit further out. One of the things that struck me whilst the next person's thinking of their question is um, I'm a parent, three children, and ever since they were born, technology has been overwhelming us, and I'm obsessed, as has their mother, about the impact it's going to have on their relationships. <clears throat> because will they interact properly with people? Mm. And you hear that conversation all the time. But actually, yeah. what you're describing suggests relationships remain very much at the heart of the use that we can make of technology, yeah. rather than us driving us apart, bringing us together. That seems slightly contradictory. Well, I'm a parent as well, and we struggle with the same thing. We've got four boys. The oldest one's 29, and I forecast that people wouldn't leave home till about 30. Unfortunately, it's turning out to be true. <laughs> so my house is still awash with people. I'm thinking of moving out, actually. But the, the, the point is you've got... I've watched my kids, and I've, I've, I've sometimes had this discussion with my wife because she comes at it from a slightly different perspective. People are using new tools to engage with their mates. Mm. I mean, Barney, who's 14 in my house, he... He, he'll probably talk in one evening to eight, nine, ten of his mates, engaging in different games on different platforms, doing different things, and he gets his homework done, and he's in the hockey team, and he's in the cricket team, and he plays rugby, and he goes out skateboarding or something odder than that he's got at the moment, out in the street as, as well. So saying to, to stop doing that and go and talk to someone, have a real relationship, isn't real. It's not the way it really is. Controlling people's time on mindless games and and even connected games is probably not a bad thing as people can't when they're young are not very good at judgment so wouldn't necessarily know when too much is too much but when i hear them screaming at the, at the set because the, you know <laughs> someone's trying to murder them in one of these hideous war games um then th then it's time to stop so it, you know it's judgment again isn't it because some of those worlds when he's out of the room actually I often go and shoot his mates when he doesn't see, <laughs> I, I nip in there and he wonders why he gets a lot of abuse <laughs> Uh, I was thinking about the moments when you aren't able to predict the future. So things like 2000, 2007, sorry, 8, and the economic crash, yep. which nobody <coughs> foresaw. Mm. Or the way in which what people are arguing is a coming ecological catastrophe of, you know, is going to be much bigger and much more changing of our world than anything that you're talking about. Yep. And may make all the economics on which all that technology depends utterly irrelevant. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I wonder whether you ever do those kind of rather apocalyptic futures. Yeah. Uh, um, yes. Um, I try not to dwell on them too much. Because actually black swans, as they're often called, are wild cards, mm -hmm. uh, which are, are huge impact, low probability, are uh, not that hard to work out. You can work out that climate change can have a huge, huge impact. I mean, the next volcano, everyone knows that the, 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 the Icelandic volcano that went off is always the baby one before the big one goes off. So we know it's likely to be, in a short time, that's 80 to 100 years, another wipeout in the northern hemisphere of much bigger proportion than that was that closed down the airlines. Well, the aircraft and the airlines have got smarter at knowing what ash does, mm. uh, and therefore maybe we can overcome it. So there's another push in the opposite direction. We got warned about it. But when this thing goes off, the last time I went off similar to this, uh, London froze and, and missed two summers. Uh, if you go back to the, the Thames tower. froze, and it was a disaster. And it would be a disaster for commerce and economic activity. So can you, the, the question was, can I do anything about it? Mm. At, at the big level, can I actually do anything about that going off? No, I can sort of prepare a bit. And some of the smart companies behind the scenes work on quite apocalyptic scenarios. And um, they do, the 9-11 one, for example, BA made, a huge saving because they knew how to shut down their entire operation in, in North America in one day because they had a scenario in the top drawer that worked out what happens if the air, airspace in North America was closed down. 
so they know who to send letters to to not come to work. So if you do scenario planning, which is pretty much what you're asking, and you look forward at uh, apocalyptic wars and uh, uh, climate change and, uh, and economic disasters, um, you come up with a lot of um, quite worrying scenarios. And governments do, to be fair, go through... The British government do look at these things from time to time. They come up with interesting alternative plans. So we don't have to dwell on it too much because you can't often do much about it. <laughs> with that dramatic vision of the future, um, where we'll all be able to read each other's minds and join collectively in um, reshaping the way we think about each other and ourselves. David, can I thank you very much for coming on to uh, Middlesex and giving us a, a view of the future. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.